Stefan Molyneux has done a great interview on race and IQ with Dr. Richard Lynn. I've linked the interview in the comment section below. I know a lot of you don't like to hear this, but there is a connection between the two. And I know we've all been assured that the experts have dismissed that connection, but the reality is they know it's true, they just don't want to talk about it publicly. So I don't have a problem with the case per se. I have a problem with the gap. Specifically, they leave out us Anatolians. Now the standard theory on high IQ is it developed among people living in cold, hostile climates, specifically Northern Europe and Northeast Asia. Well, I don't know about the Asians, but I know that the European scenario has a lot in common with the steppe scenario for the origin of the Indo-European language. They both tell us that brilliant warriors swooped in from the north and put us in our place. Well, if that were true, it is what it is. I would have no problem with that. But as I've shown you in my videos, that's the exact opposite of reality. In fact, as I've shown in my videos, I, there are dozens of examples of things that we did that clearly demand a high IQ. So in this one, we're going to go all the way back to Neolithic Anatolia, where we suddenly started living in large settlements like Chattel Hayup. And there, we were already behaving in a way that tells you we were very smart. Ian Hunter is the lead excavator at Chattel Hayuk. I incorporated one of his YouTube lectures in part five of my series, The Children of Proteus, which I called Flocking Together. Dr. Hodder has taken his observations at that site to a higher level of abstraction in his work, Studies in Human Thing Entanglement, which you can download free online. Network analysis has become very important in modern archaeology, and Dr. Hodder has an important wrinkle on that. I'm working very hard to absorb his ideas on entanglement because I think he's right. But for now, we're just going to stick to examples that he's given from this excavation site. Now, one thing you need to understand about us is that we were extremely social. We were forced to collaborate, and the very way we lived demanded a social situational awareness that was unparalleled anywhere else in the world at the time. And that, in turn, demands a high IQ, or at least one that's higher than average. And I'm afraid the only way you're going to get a higher than average IQ is to inherit it from your parents. In the earliest levels, up to South K and L, there are many examples of houses that shared walls. Now the different levels and their timing are listed on the left. Things got very different after South K, L, and M. In one case, a pair of houses was built on the same foundation raft. This type of construction saves energy during construction as only one wall has to be built between neighboring houses. But it also meant that collapsing or leaning walls affected more than one house or building. Uh huh. It meant that if one house needed to be rebuilt, Coordination was needed with all the other attached buildings. And so after South K and L, the typical Chattel Hayuk settlement pattern emerges of buildings built up against each other, but each with its own walls. In this way, each building could be rebuilt independently. Much, of, much has been written of the clustered neighborhood settlement patterns at Chattel Hayuk and other sites in central Anatolia. This closely knit clustering could be seen as a practical solution to the problem of collapsing walls. Each house could be rebuilt independently, while at the same time leaning up against and supported by neighboring buildings. Any thin gaps between walls were filled in so that each building protected its neighbor from rain and weather. So, not only did this help us shore up our sagging walls, but it helped us learn how to work together. Now here's something about evolution that I want you to keep in mind. Molyneux and Lynn talk about it in relation to human IQ, but really it applies to all evolution everywhere. We're taught that evolution is driven by random mutation, but I never believed that. I used to be a creationist, so you know I didn't then. I still don't. It seems to me that it should be obvious that our bodies know when they're in a new environment, and they start changing to adapt to that environment, on purpose. I say this because whenever animals enter into a new niche, the rate of their evolution increases dramatically. We see that in the fossil record with marine mammals. We see that in the fossil record after the death of the dinosaurs, when a whole world opens up to the survivors. Are we to assume that the rate of random mutation suddenly jumps up during times like this? I don't see why it should. So it seems to me our cells do more than just read and write DNA. I think they play with it. But how? Well, according to one very interesting theory, they take a walk. I read about that theory in Andreas Wagner's book, Arrival of the Fittest. It's an obvious title. We've all heard about the survival of the fittest. Well, how did these fittest show up in the first place? I think Dr. Wagner has given us a very important piece of the puzzle, but I suspect that even if he's right, and I think he is, there's more to be found. I'm just giving you the heads up because I think we're in for a lot of surprises here. But let's get back to the topic. 
The way we lived at Chattel Hayuk is not the only indication that we must have been very smart. We also lived in high style, and we worked very hard, and most importantly, very smart, to maintain that style. It is possible that hunting was retained by farmers as a risk-buffering exercise amongst early agriculturalists. This might be part of the story, but it cannot be a full account. Risk-buffering does not seem adequate to account for the enormous amount of symbolism surrounding hunting in the wild. So another possibility is to turn the argument around and say herding and agriculture came in as a buffer for an increased focus on hunting, not just in terms of nutrition, but in terms of the vast social world it was caught up in. The specific evidence from Chattel Hayuk allows some answers to these questions, very late in the pre pottery neolithic B, pottery neolithic process. It is particularly interesting to examine the role of hunting at a site with fully developed farming and domestication, although domestic cattle were not adopted until the middle of the sequence and domestic pigs were never adopted. That's after that KL and M period. Very important. Indeed, it is possible that hunting in this context was manufactured, okay? Peters and his co-workers have suggested that perhaps the quote-unquote wild cattle at Chattel Hayu might have been managed but intentionally bred with free-ranging wild males in order to maintain a highly desired wild phenotype, size, color, horn shape, etc. Genotype is the gene, phenotype is how the genes are expressed. It is of interest that large parts of whole caucuses seem to be present at the site. This would be surprising if the cattle were a traditionally hunted large game resource. Even if managed in some way, it is clear that the wild and hunted aspects of bulls were valued. We knew how domestication worked. We'd done it ourselves, and by this time cattle had already been domesticated. In fact, we might have been the ones who domesticated them. The history of this is muddied by the fact that we wouldn't have followed up on that for several centuries. I'll talk about why I think we did that in a few minutes. But the cattle with the greatest genetic variety are in the Taurus Mountains, just south of the Konya Plain where we lived, the mountains of the bulls. All things being equal, they would be the oldest. And then there's the fact that we went out of our way to not domesticate our cattle. That calls on the exact same skill set. Nobody knows. Now our story gets even more complicated, and we're about to look at behaviors that made even greater cognitive demands. There are other aspects of entanglements around elongated points. The sourcing of lithic material that had sufficient quality to be finely flaked into long blades and into bifacial points required long-distance exchange or travel. Understanding of this process has been increased by research at Chattel Hayuk, where much effort has been put into sourcing large numbers of obsidian artifacts. Carter and Millick show that the blanks used to make projectiles were all products of specialist workshops 160 kilometers away in Cappadocia, it's about 100 miles, either Calatepe bifaces or large opposed platform blades from Nenezi Dog. I'm probably hacking these names to bits. Once on site, the bifaces were buried in caches below the floors in the southern parts of main rooms of houses, so that's probably important. Later, they would be retrieved, thinned, and retouched in the houses in order to produce projectile points. These weapons thus had multiple authorships spread over space and time, from Cappadocia to individual houses at Chattel Hayuk. The projectile points could thus be used to build up individual histories and identities. The clearest example of distinct identities associated with obsidian tools at Chattel Hayuk is the scratching of distinctive marks at Kanasan three points. But more generally, one also notes the stylistic and scalar variability of the projectiles, both diachronically and synchronically, not only through time, that is, but at the same time. Differences that we do not consider to be related to functionality alone. On the basis of ethnographic parallels, we argue that the wielding and use of these weapons was closely related to the creation, maintenance, and expression of social identities, such as age grade status, kin group, and ethnicity. The burial and retrieval of caches of obsidian was also linked to the process of construction and abandonment of houses at Chattel Hayuk. In the earliest phase of use of Building 60, there was a cluster of thinning flakes from a Calatepe biface which had been swept up and included in a nearby bench prior to the associated biface then being buried in a hoard. There is much evidence from other buildings of projectile manufacture at the time of house construction. Equally, the abandonment and dismantling of houses was also associated with projectile point deposition, especially the placing of used or broken points at post-retrieval pits, or in abandoned bins or on platforms. In numerous ways, then, projectile points used in hunting or warfare were interrelated with people, houses, and their identities and histories. Long-distance trade makes cognitive demands. 
making arrows and original art at the same time makes cognitive demands. And it wasn't just arrows. Different groups had different decorative motifs. Different families had different recipes for making bricks. I'm sure it was not uncommon for a father to take his son down to Cappadocia to buy his first cores. The trip would have taken about a week going each direction, and I'm sure the boy would have remembered it fondly for the rest of his life. And when they got home, the father would have helped his son make his first arrows. I can't think of a finer way for a father to help make his son into a man. My ancestors were very smart, and they were pious. They had a reverence for the great death and the eternal, and it's easy to get caught up in that and in the rut of tradition. And yet they managed to be explosively creative for thousands of years. So for us, the eternal isn't a rut. It's a rocket fuel. We are very much the sons of our father. This technological approach to religion might appear to differ from accounts grounded in cognitive evolution. Basically, Hodder sees religion as a technology that is used to grapple with distant entanglements that we're not aware of, which nevertheless affect us. For example, Guthrie argues that religion is linked to the evolution of cognitive tendencies to see agency in the world, often in our own image. We have an evolutionary tendency to see animacy in things, and in particular, we anthropomorphize, make it human. For example, at Chattel Hayuk, the house was born, had a life, and then died and was buried. In a similar vein, Boyer describes religious forces as counterintuitive agents that we are drawn to because they are both familiar and unfamiliar. We believe that these agents can help us deal with misfortune because we have social minds, and so we are predisposed to think that misfortune is social, is caused by someone. But it is not clear that the bullhorns around the burial platform in Building 77 need involve either of these claims by Guthrie and Boyer. The bullhorns can be seen as powerful in their own right without any anthropomorphism involved, and the agency of the horns can derive directly from the bulls without any social causality imputed. Rather, we can say that finding solutions to entanglements can make use of a very wide range of cognitive processes, including anthropomorphism, or tending to seek social agents, but the religious impulse does not seem restricted to these techniques. There's a lot of complicated theory going on here. I just want you to notice Hodder's example and his take on it. We were very big on bull horns. And these horns seem to have represented potency, potential, power, always ready to unleash, which of course makes me immediately think of Potnia, the famous serpent goddess of Crete, who I think is actually Mother Earth. Potnia is an old Indo-European word for lady or wife, and it is only in Latin that this word has come to this meaning, which in itself should give you the heads up that the Romans and the Minoans are related, and they, in turn, ultimately came from places like Chattel Hayuk. And this is what I think of when I think of Potnia. She is wound up and ready to launch into the world at a moment's notice, whenever and wherever there is creation needing to be done. It is Potnia who drives evolution, and evolution, like Potnia, pounces when it needs to. And so all we need is a Potnia. Do we have a Potnia? Probably. Here she is at Chattel Hayuk on the left, and Rome on the right. Striking, isn't it? She was on Crete, too. You could see it here in the Linear A inscription. Ida Mate, Mother Ida. This example of the Mother Goddess comes about 500 years too late for my case. But just because the example is from 6000 BC doesn't mean she wasn't around in 6500 BC. For it's about that time that we started moving into the world in a big way. I talk about that in my series, The Children of Proteus, Part 6. The children go forth. We also seem to have been in something of a civil cold war, or it doesn't seem to have degenerated into a hot war. Since my ancestors were the ones to leave, assuming they were there, we must have been on the losing side. After that, the settlement pattern changes, and they start using domesticated cattle. They're also overworked and overpopulated. And then after that, they abandon cattle. It's almost as if abandoning the Arak cursed Chattel Hayuk. No hard feelings. It was just time to move on. Every dog has its day, and every day comes to an end. But I think I can work with these observations, and I can assume that these people had a sophisticated view of the world that they carried with them and built on over the next few thousand years, also the hallmark of a high IQ population. Their horns showed up again on Minoan Crete, where we find the famous horns of consecration. Where you find horns of consecration, you find Minoans. One of the reasons I know the famous sea people are the Minoans is because these horns disappear for almost 300 years after my Minoan ancestors were expelled from Crete. Then they suddenly pop up again on Cyprus, and in a big way, after the Sea People had conquered it. Here there be Minoans. 
At the so-called palaces on Crete, we have the same juxtaposition of the power of the bull alongside mother. Here, we have a very famous relief of a bull on the outside, and inside we have a throne with a seat specifically fashioned to hold a woman's bottom. And don't forget the Minoan bull leapers. This is also something they did at the palaces. The bull is dangerous when the world is dangerous. But did we bitch and moan? Did we collapse in despair? Did the danger and the harshness of the world make us bitter? No. We met danger face to face. And he taught us how to dance. You have to be quick of mind and quick of body if you're going to dance like that. I bet these were the sexiest men in the world. The Minoans and the people at Chattel Hayuk both used wild aurochs in their religion. I don't think that's a coincidence, and I think we can know now why they resisted domesticated cattle for so long. This was an act of piety for Potnia, the lady, and I think this is just more evidence that we're looking at the same people. Now, a wild aurochs is very different from a moo cow that you'll see in a Texas rodeo today. They were bigger and more violent, true beasts, serious animals for serious people. So when I look back at this dream that I had in college, I talk about it in Lady Trouble. I see from Hodder's book that my psyche is even more deeply embedded in Anatolian history than I thought. I had this dream because I was alienated from my deep roots, and my psyche was sending out a distress signal. And why am I talking about this in my videos? Because of C.G. Young and his theory of the collective unconscious. And I am convinced, as he was, that our collective unconscious has roots that stretch back thousands of years and that this unconscious behaves in many respects in a manner indistinguishable from a racial memory. And so, at my core, I remember what it was like to live on the Kanya Plain during the Neolithic. So I think it would be helpful if archaeologists started interviewing people around the world, thousands of people, and they would ask them this question. Is there a dream that you've had that is so spectacular that years later you still remember it and wish you can get to the bottom of it? And then they would attach this dream to their personal DNA file. And that's because a dream like this is more likely to have come up from the greatest depth of the collective unconscious. And at this level, it's less likely to have been contaminated by modern ideas. And provided these people aren't lying and are of sound mind and body, you might be able to get into the skin of their ancestors. Wouldn't that be great? I think I'm doing it. And let me give you an even more spectacular example of that. I'm sitting and meditating on a mountain. I can see a little around me because I'm sitting in Zazen with my eyes half open and my head slightly turned down, I suddenly hear a mountain lion in the distance. I don't move. The lion is getting closer and closer. I can tell because it growls intermittently. It's getting louder. I don't move. Now she's right next to me. I can see her out of the corner of my eye and I can feel her breath. She's still growling. I worry she's going to take a bite out of my face. But I don't move. Suddenly, she starts to purr. Then she starts licking the side of my face. Her tongue is so strong it almost knocks me over. It's shocking and delightful. I laugh so hard the noise of my laughter in real life wakes me up. So the cat is back. We see her in Chattel Hayuk, associated with the mother. And Mano and Crete, that doubling down again in my psyche. Now here's my big example. We saw something spectacular about 6900 BC, long before we moved out of the Kanya Plain. And I think I remember it. Mount Hassan erupted, that right peak. I talked about this in my video, Old Friends. And we immortalized that eruption. Notice the right peak is throwing rocks up in the air. That's exactly what happened. The left peak is also tilted to the left. The top is the original image, and the bottom is a modern reconstruction. But notice that the artist made the mountain look like a stretched out leopard skin. So some scholars don't even think this is a mountain. I don't see why it can't be both. The mother is the world. The big cat represents the mother. And this mountain probably sounded like it was growling from 80 miles away at Chattel Hayuk. And think about the details of this dream. We have a mountain. We have a big cat. We have growling, which starts off from a distance. And we have the love. Mother finds her lost kit, her own little runaway bunny, all the way over here in Texas. If I had heard this mountain, and then that night I had a dream, you would have assumed the mountain provoked the dream. So my interpretation is not unreasonable, except the mountain erupted almost 9,000 years ago. So if archaeologists are going to take the collective unconscious seriously, they need to keep in mind what is preserved. We're not looking at details like a volcanic eruption. 
this memory core is conservative. It needs to be to be compact and to allow easy access to the data that's in it. This event, these experiences, are condensed to their psychological essentials. And these essentials tend to gravitate around a small number of archetypical nodes. This memory core needs to be essential in order to stay compact and to stay useful. Think about it. In your house, you have all these flat surfaces. And if you don't keep, keep on top of it, all of these surfaces are going to get cluttered. And then you won't be able to find anything. It's the same principle. Also, this needs to get passed down to the next generation in a very small space. So a small house that's well organized is easier to move than a big house that's cluttered. The principle is called KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. And there's another way in which these nodes, these archetypes, are very much like genes. Some genes and their alleles are more heavily relied upon and are therefore more likely to proliferate and bear mutations successfully into the next generation of the DNA. It's the same thing here. Some of these archetypes are more heavily relied upon by the unconscious. And this parallel organizational scheme is very fitting since we're looking at a parallel information stream. The DNA tells us how we're gonna build our body. The archetypes and the collective unconscious tells us about the world this body is gonna live in. Okay. Now, let me go to another dream here. This one is gonna follow the criteria that I've set, just like these previous ones, that I set back in Lady Trouble. It's one that's so amazing that it wakes me up. And this is exactly the kind of dreams that I'm gonna want archeologists to look for. Now that I've done this video, I know who this character is, and so will you, although there is one tiny wrinkle. I'm walking in a white space, like I'm on a piece of paper. All of a sudden I hear, tick, 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 ticker. Ticker the tiger from Weenie the Pooh pops up out of a hole in the ground in front of me, right as he announces his name. It's a shock. I laugh so loud, the noise of my laughter in real life wakes me up. The wrinkle, of course, is Tigger is a boy tiger. I think we inherited more than just an above average IQ, and I think we did get that. I think we also got a stronger than average connection with our racial memory. It gives us a head start when we're dealing with the problems of the world. I think that's why we're better than average at building empires, and we're just about the only game in town at building world-class religions. It reminds me of something that I've said several times in my videos. We are a race of priests and psychologists. And who knows? Maybe dreaming is the only way to make a racial memory. And when I had my dream, I resurrected the original dream, provoked by Mount Hassan almost 9,000 years ago. Now, as I said, the mother archetype is very heavily relied upon by the collective unconscious, more heavily than most. She's loving, she's kind, she's nurturing, indeed. But mother has a nasty side, especially when little baby boy is too scared or too lazy to grow up. Then she turns on a dime. Any young Indian analyst would tell you that. On this day, you're going to die, little boy. So on your feet. Whether or not you step out into the world as a man at the end of it is entirely up to you. We didn't worship a kooky earth goddess. Our mother was the Spartan mother, who told us to come back with her shield or on it. Forget your fantasies about the wild Indo-European steppe warriors who swarmed in and beat up the dirt farmers. We beat the snot out of them plenty, and we'd still be given better than we got if it weren't for the Islamic conquest. But now let's move this on to another famously smart group of people, the Ashkenazi Jews. This is a smart tribe of Jews, but they're not nearly as smart as you think. That 116 average compared to the 100 average for white men is a bullshit number that's pulled from small, unrepresentative samples. I grant them a 106 IQ, verbal. That's still pretty high, but I know where they got it from. They got it from marrying Romans. I talk about this paper in the video Victory Lap. Genome-wide patterns of selection in 230 ancient Eurasians. All the Jews are in pink. There seem to be at least four tribes of them, probably from a core Jewish group intermixing with various locals. Here are the Ashkenazi. And the Romans are dead center, pulling everyone in, exactly what you'd expect if the Romans were Anatolians whose ancestors spoke the first Indo-European language. As I showed in that video, we've been pulling Europeans into our orbit for thousands of years. Once again, exactly what you would expect. Although I have to use the Bulgarians as proxies for the Romans because all these scientists doing all these DNA papers refuse to look at central Italy, which is where most of the Romans lived, most of the other Italic tribesmen too. Here's another paper, localizing Ashkenazi Jews to primeval villages in the ancient Iranian lands of the Ashkenaz. Although these are not Iranian lands, these are Roman lands, and they remain firmly under medieval Roman control until 1461 after the fall of Constantinople. Here you see the Ashkenazi are a big column just to the left of center, a nice mix of Turk and Bulgarian, 
who I once again used as a proxy for the Romans. I surely wish I could use data directly pulled from central Italy, but as I said, they refused to do that. But you do see Tuscany just to the right of the Greeks, who themselves are to the right of the Bulgarians. Tuscany is directly north of Rome. It shares a border with Lazio, which is the Italian province that includes Rome. Here you see another graph. The Ashkenazi are in the upper left corner. The Bulgarians are the brown dots right beneath them. No surprises here. But we do have a surprise here. The most important of the Jews are the Kohen. That means priest. And when you meet a Kohen, you meet a man who claims priestly lineage. But another name for Kohen is allegedly Kagan, which is a Turkish word. And sure enough, the Ashkenazi Kohens, or Kagans, look a lot more like Turks than they do their fellow Ashkenazi Jews. Here they're called Ashkenazic Turks. The other Ashkenazi are labeled Yiddish speakers here. There is a theory that the Ashkenazi Jews are descendants of people living in the old steppe kingdom of the Khazars, who converted to Judaism. Well, as we see, they're not. They're Romans. But their leaders are probably Khazars. I can go back even farther, in Europe and Turkey. For example, I don't think those people in Northern Europe have a high IQ because they were forced to deal with a cold environment. I think they were able to deal with a cold environment because they already had a high IQ. We've gotten samples from the first hunter-gatherers in Europe, the people who actually met the Neanderthals. They have an IY chromosome. I have a JY chromosome. We come from men with an IJY chromosome, and they're still alive today in Iran. They have more in common with us than they do those Indo-European steppe invaders. You've heard about the famous European cave art. They're the ones who did it. They also invented the bow and arrow and the flute. These people were already smart when they moved into Europe. Molyneux's interview is interesting, but both he and his guests need to rework their case, because it's incomplete, and because they put the cart before the horse. But I don't blame them. Everybody is doing that. They're all blowing off the Anatolians.